You know, before you had to study your lessons when you was going to school, you had to study your lessons in the, the light of a kerosene lamp. And it, you had to be right up under it to be able to see what you were doing. See that ironing, washing, you know, rub it on rub board. Put them in an iron kettle and boil them and then back and rub them again and then hang them on the line. The women actually had it harder back, I think, in those days than the men because they was expected to cook all the meals, three meals a day, plus working in the fields a lot. And it takes so long to cook a meal on a wood stove. Although nearly 90% of urban dwellers had electricity by the 1930s, only 10% of rural residents did. Investor-owned utilities, who supplied electric power to most of the nation's consumers, argued that it was too expensive to build electric lines to isolated rural farmsteads. The Roosevelt administration believed that if private enterprise could not supply electric power to the people, then it was the duty of the government to do so. Under Roosevelt's leadership, the Rural Electrification Administration, or REA, was created in 1935 to bring electricity to rural areas like Arkansas. At the time that I first became associated with it, uh, the people were working on farms, the vast majority were farm people. Billy Bryant recalls the story of his father's efforts to bring electricity to his family's North Arkansas farm in the early 1930s. And they asked him $1,200 to, uh, to bring electricity into him. Well, that was only like three or 400 feet. And uh, he said, well, that's more than the farm is worth. So he said, if I can't have convenient electricity, I will move to Ships Ferry, so we moved down on the farm on the river in Ships Ferry. I don't think there's anything better ever happened to the world and to the United States, and especially in Arkansas. See, when they first built the line, they didn't go off to all the houses. They just went right straight down 62 Highway because it's a federal highway, and that's that. And then they've come back later and built off, you know. Of course, they did it through loans that they get ever so often to do a certain part of the work. Many groups, especially investor-owned utilities, opposed the federal government's involvement in developing and distributing electric power. These groups said the government was unfairly competing with private enterprise. Some members of Congress believed that REA was a dangerous program that would bring the nation a step closer to socialism. Others said farmers simply did not have the skills needed to manage local electric companies. Despite those sentiments, the program survived, largely through the vision of such strong leaders as Harry L. Oswald, the first general manager of the Arkansas State Electric Cooperative Incorporated, now known as Arkansas Electric Cooperatives, Inc., or AECI. I work with RFC Processing Indiana REMCs Rural Electric Membership Cooperative Loans. I saw this film, Power in the Land, and I said, this is the way to go for me. So I left RFC and went to REA, moved out to St. Louis, and was a administrative assistant there for Region 8, and wrote loans for all of the cooperatives to the point that I knew all the managers and all the directors in Region 8. I went to work for them, and I think in reflection, I don't see how I could have been more foolish than I was. I was making $5,600 a year with the federal government, and uh, was, my next move was back to Washington, and that is what I didn't want. My wife was pregnant with the second child about seven months. My mother had been terminally, declared terminally ill, and they, the money that they was going to finance me with, pay my salary with, was obeyed by assessments. And Earl Walden, who was manager of Craighead, which was the big one, said, I don't think my, my, my co-op is going to go with this very long. So those were the circumstances under which I took the job. Soon after taking the helm at the statewide, Oswald found he would need new sources of revenue to support the organization, in addition to the traditional fees or assessments paid by the cooperatives. I was told by the board of directors, principally Mr. Walden of Craighead and Mr. Knappberger of Mississippi County, that you are going to have to figure out some way 
to make some money to provide for yourself because my board may take out of this assessment any time. So I said, well, how do you suggest? And they said, well, the transformer business might be lucrative. And I recognized that it wasn't just going to be a political business that I was going to be operating, but also an economic one. I put in a meter shop and put in a print shop. The electric distribution cooperatives were having financial difficulties as well. As a child, Billy Bryant accompanied his father, Clyde, to sign up members for North Arkansas Electric Cooperative. It wasn't easy. I would probably have been nine years old, and uh, we'd go to the people's house and they'd say, well, Clyde, I don't have the five dollars, and uh, I'd love to have it, but I don't have the money. Well, see, they only made a dollar a day in those days, and that's a week's wages. And uh, we'd go to the next one and he'd say, well, uh, I would kind of like to have it, but I'm afraid it'd burn my house down. They were scared of electricity. And then we go to the next one, and uh, the uh, guy would have the $5. And he was ready. And his wife was in tears because she just was so glad to, to get electricity because those poor women back in those days had it rough. Jack Cochran, a longtime manager for North Arkansas Electric Cooperative, describes just how his cooperative grew. Kilowatt hour consumption was the lowest in the state. So we went on a selling appliances. We, we bought some new trucks, bought appliances car loaded at a time, and hired some salesmen. And they went out knocking from door to door, and we put the appliances out there. We had a good finance plan. And, uh, they really, they really put them appliances in. Once it got started, everybody wanted to range in a water heater. Nobody, there was only two water heaters on the whole system that I knew of that picked up and, and took off. We started it, got the ball rolling, and they picked up and made it just fine. Promoting the use of such labor-saving appliances was a key to the success of the cooperatives. Demonstrations of electric ranges and refrigerators were a mainstay at the cooperative's popular annual meetings. When we got electricity, of course, we thought we just really had the light then, and did. I remember how proud we was when we got our refrigerator. I didn't, at that time, I didn't have my washing machine. I, I got a refrigerator first, and uh, we were so proud of that, you know, because <laughs> we just had to cook. I mean, what you're going to use almost for that meal, you know. As the use of the new appliances grew, so did the cooperatives. Despite the growth, the cooperatives still didn't control their own destiny. One of the biggest early problems was power supply. Only one power supplier that we'd get power from, that was Arkansas Power and Light Company. And uh, they pretty well wrote the ticket. With an investor-owned utility as the only power supplier, the cooperatives couldn't control their rates. If the cooperatives were to continue to provide reliable and affordable electricity to their members, they would need to take another bold step. In 1949, they took that step when they created Arkansas Electric Cooperative Corporation to build and operate power plants. So the Arkansas Electric Cooperative Corp was formed by a Carroll Electric Cooperative Arkansas Valley Electric Cooperative, and uh, see Ozarks Electric Cooperative. Those three, that was all. At each, there was two directors from each one of those three. And we got a loan for $10.5 million with the help of Congressman Jim Trimble, primarily, uh, to build a power plant at Ozark and a 30,000 kW plant. In addition to the loan, the cooperatives received permission from state regulators to build the power plant and transmission lines. But the investor-owned utilities fought it, taking the issue to the Arkansas Supreme Court. In 1953, the court ruled against the cooperatives, halting the project. I told the board, I said, uh, not just those three co-ops are at stake here. All of you are at stake. You need to all participate in this. 
whether you are going to get power from it or not. With the cooperatives firmly behind AECC, the political tides turn. In 1955, a state law passed granting authority to AECC to build and operate power plants. Two years later, the cooperatives won another major battle when a law was passed freezing their service territories and protecting them from encroachment from the other power companies. In 1963, AECC's first power plant, the Thomas B. Fitzhugh Generating Station at Ozark, was built. Other battles have been won and lost over the decades. And throughout it all, the cooperatives have continued to prosper. Challenges will continue to come, and yet the electric cooperatives in Arkansas will always be the one voice heard to protect the interests of the electric cooperative members. From a single pole erected in 1937 to approximately 500,000 members, the development of the state's electric cooperatives is one of Arkansas's true success stories. We will forever stand on the shoulders of the early pioneers of the rural electrification movement for their commitment to Arkansas's electric cooperative members and for turning the lights on in Arkansas.